Welcome to Shed Island, and uh, today we have a special guest, Kevin Logan. Uh, he's been uh, around on YouTube for several years now, covering the men's rights movement sphere going on on YouTube, and occasionally dipping into the real world. And we have a nice hour-long interview uh, for with him set up, so enjoy. Well, I'm uh, Kevin Logan, and I'm a, a low-grade, uh, low-production quality, um, shit-tier leftist YouTuber. Nah, just the way we love them. Yeah, can you give a bit of a description of uh, your series, The Descent of Man, O Sphere? Well, firstly, thank you for pronouncing it correctly. People often pronounce it The Descent of Manosphere, and it's not. It's The Descent of Man, O Sphere. That's the joke. That's the pun. Come on now. Yeah, I, I, I've been listening to it for a long time. I, I know. Uh, well, exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah, people who have watched all of the episodes still pronounce it incorrectly. And I think I pronounce it right for you at the start of every episode. Come on now. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. It is. It's, well, it's unacceptable. I mean, come on the revolution, these people will have to be purged. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Bring out the guillotines. Yes, uh, in terms of the series, it's um, I profile an individual usually, although occasionally it's an event. Um, but usually it's an individual from, uh, well, we'll get on to, I suppose, the progression of it, but uh, from the manosphere broadly or the kind of alt-right or whatever, and the lines on exactly how you define those terms is quite broad and, and loose, really. They're not very well defined, certainly anymore. Not that they ever really were. Anyway, someone from, you know, some right-wing shithead, basically, uh, and I analyse uh, their general um, online presence refute a few of the arguments and um, call them rude names. <laughs> uh, that, that's the best part, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, so how did you get started on this series, anyway? Well, I'll be honest, I came up with the pun first. <laughs> well, that's how this uh, podcast developed. Yeah. Wait, well, that's the thing. You come up with a joke first, and then you try and think of a series. Now, um, well, I was already doing, essentially, these sorts of videos about these sorts of characters, anyway. Um... But I wanted to do like a kind of, it's not really meant to be definitive or anything, but the kind of an analysis of these individuals, because I find them fascinating uh, in the same way that one might find, uh, I don't know, a, a monkey eating another monkey fascinating. <laughs> um, and I, I see them very much on that same level of um, cognitive development, frankly. Um yeah, I, so I wanted to do that and I came up with a name and I thought, okay, well, I can do something with that that has like um there's a hook to that, you know, that makes, that is, um, there's a thread that runs through the entire series where it's based on the, um, um, profile and, um, uh, what was it? The, the four P's, ponage, profile and pop psychology, right? Where I, I take you through the individual as a person, their politics, give you a profile of them and then kind of try and break them down into like, why are they trying to do this? What's their motivation? And so, um, that's how I sort of came up with the um, the basic concept. Although it's, it's developed a lot, really. It's no, it's nothing like it was at the start. I think people who've seen all of the episodes will know that, or a fair few of the episodes will know that. Do you mainly uh, approach them from a stance of like anger, or do you want to? Are you uh, honestly trying to understand them, or how do you think that we should kind of approach these people that are extremely online and extremely reactionary? Oh wow. Um, well, it depends. I, I, in terms of the series, it depends on the episode. Like, some of them are just funny. I just literally, I just laugh at them. Like, the next one, I won't reveal who it's going to be, because that's not how I roll. But um, <laughs> Keep us uh, in suspense. it's going to be one where I'm basically laughing at an idiot. Right. Uh, and that's always fun. Oh, there could be so many people. In, well, indeed, yeah. It doesn't narrow it down enormously. Um, no. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be laughing at an idiot, because the last couple have been... One was a neo-Nazi murderer, and yeah. one was um, about the actions and reactions to another neo-Nazi murderer, uh, that being the, uh, the the thing that happened in uh, New Zealand. So those have been mm -hmm. very angry, dark, very unpleasant episodes, um, and I don't want it to just be that as a series. Um, I want them to be a sort of a mixture where there are some of them that are going to be... Um, uh, funny and uh, really humorous and just sort of uh, 
pleasant in a way, and some of them are going to be very dark. But hopefully, the the thing, the reaction that I want from the series is the reaction that I get for myself personally, and I know a lot of other people do too, is one of catharsis, mm. where it's genuinely like a release of um, anger and uh, derision and humour at the expense of these people, mm. and that's ultimately what I'm trying to get from the series. Now, in terms of, I mean, you asked me. Um, how do we how, approach how do you them? Deal in, with them? Yeah. yeah, how do we deal with them? Well, again, that sort of depends, really, on the type of person that it is. With someone stupid and just ignorant, like, say, Warcorp666, although he doesn't, he isn't call, even called that anymore, um, but he was one of the people I, I dealt with early in the series, um, that person isn't really a danger, so you don't need to be angry and confrontational, but you can still um, take them on and laugh at them because it's idiotic. The things they say are just demonstrably incorrect and or stupid. Um, and the, But there are some people who are very dangerous. Fox Day, for instance, um, is, I, I think, a, some sort of hideous um, concentration camp guard in the waiting, frankly. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, I genuinely think that. He just hasn't had the opportunity, thankfully, because modern Europe isn't that way, although unfortunately it's moving in that direction. Uh, if he ever got the chance, he would ha- absolutely be a, 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 a Hess character of you know a, a Auschwitz fame. Um, he's an awful, awful human being. Um, and so you deal with that person very differently. That person needs to be... Um, kept a very strong eye on by the authorities, frankly, because he's a very dangerous individual. Um, as a number of the people are, Varg Vikernish, um, the, the, the neo-Nazi murderer I, I mentioned earlier, is in the similar camp there. And so it depends on the individual and it depends on the movement. Because, like I say, mm. the manosphere isn't really a thing anymore. Uh, not that it ever was one thing, but it isn't really, it doesn't exist. It's sort of diversified into various uh, different yeah, avenues. I was wondering if you could. Um... If you could describe like what it was sort of when you started and what the landscape looks like uh, now. Oh yeah, um, the manosphere was uh, the kind of tra- what what we would see as traditional, although traditional means like four years ago. So we're not talking about a huge space of time here. Um, was made up of three main groups. There were the MRAs, the men's rights activists. Um, uh, you had uh, the MIGTOs, uh, the men going their own way, and the PUAs, the pickup artists. And there was a three very sort of divergent things in many respects, but all of them had the unifying factor of despising women. So that mm. that that was what the manosphere was, mm. and the uh, the exact boundaries of what was a manosphereian and what wasn't, what classified one as being part of that group or whatever, has changed enormously. But even then, it's sort of none of those groups are anywhere near as unified. And not that they really were unified, but they've they, they've become. They've sort of splintered off into these different groups. And a lot of them from all three of those camps have moved into what became the alt-right. Although even the alt-right doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but yeah, they've they've moved into a sort of far-right direction, which is precisely why I started chronicling them in the first place, because I could see them going in that direction anyway. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so I, I had two questions. Uh, firstly, regarding when you talked about people who you perceive to be dangerous i was thinking do you ever feel worried that people are gonna dox you or try to get after you in some way oh they already have oh wow (laughs) that's that's already happened and um i won't go into too much detail but i had a kind of sink or swim moment with it where i decided either you carry on down this line or you get out now Mm. and uh, i mean it sort of sounds uh, full of myself or whatever, but I don't kowtow to terrorists. That's precisely what they were trying to be. Mm. Uh, so fuck them. Fair enough. Mm. Um, I have another I have another question. Um, you, you mentioned, and I think this is true for a lot of, of leftists on YouTube, that you use catharsis a lot in your um, uh, in how you approach these people that are so seemingly uh, crazy for us living in, in this very leftist mindset, I guess you could call it. Um, but I was just, I was curious because you have a lot of leftist thinkers right now that are coming out, uh, like, um, uh, Angela Nagel and Akachi and Mark Fisher and others that have kind of criticized this tendency of using humor to disparage these people because they don't really, it, it, it historically has come across as extremely arrogant and feeding into the narrative of the, of the, um, the, the fascist right, if you will. So I was just curious, do, do you think that, that, um, that that humor is is something. Do you, do you see your product essentially as something that's going to turn 
people away from their current line of thinking or are you more catering to the already established leftist online market if you will um well for both basically i mean ultimately you, you can only really make content that you want to exist mm. right you can't i i mean i think it's it might be more successful in a sense to try and cater to a certain audience, but essentially I make videos that I think need to exist for some reason on some level. I do it for my own entertainment, my own catharsis and all the rest of it. Um, but knowing that a, a lot of other people will have similar reactions to it and I, I enjoy and, uh, and indeed I'm greatly appreciative that people watch my videos at all. So, it, so it's sort of both in the sense that uh, I th there's, a, there's a point to what I do, what I do. I'm trying to reach people who um, might be uh, persuadable, if, that is, if that's even a word, people who might be um, amenable to listening to those kind of ideas. Um, but I'm also doing it for other leftists as well. Mm. Uh, because, I mean, I started my channel because there weren't enough leftists doing what they were doing. And it could be argued that there now are, and I could stop. But I'm sort of, you know, I've started down the path now, so I might as well. Um but in terms of in terms of the academics you mentioned, I think they're fundamentally missing the point. Uh, and I'm not going to attack them as if in the way that they've seemingly attacked people who use humour or catharsis, because actually I think it needs all of those approaches. I think it needs strong academic, um, more uh, philosophical type uh, people to as a kind of underpinning for leftist thought going forwards, um, and uh, it needs people doing academic research to you know get involved with um, uh, non-governmental organizations and think tanks and stuff to try and influence political um, you know uh, directly uh, uh, political bodies and legislative bodies and things like that I think it needs people making uh, content like the content that I create or even better content creators like ContraPoints and HBomberGuy and Three Arrows uh, to directly take on and debunk and to some extent belittle um those who need to be belittled and it needs it right down to the very bottom of like people who just create kind of shit tier leftist memes on message boards and stuff you need all of that across the board so to single out one thing as oh well that might turn people away there'll be lots of stuff that'll turn people away i mean you're never going to get through to people on all of those ways but the only way you can cover all of your bases and try and have the biggest impact possible is to have all of those different approaches covered by leftists that's that's a that's a very fair point I think and another thing that um, I think is 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 a good approach at least when it comes to persuading people on the right to consider their uh, their ideology is that they they tend to like it when people like dunk on other people who who like or win debates like there's a lot of uh, of this alpha male uh, as as you've covered like this uh, gorilla mindset type stuff where it's it's about being alpha and confronting yeah. people aggressively. So I think I think you're right that that we definitely we need to be aggressively presenting our points and not showing ourselves to be afraid. But my 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 main point was that um, I guess since the since the end of the Second World War, the way that we've treated the extreme right has has often been one of assuming that they are of lesser intelligence. And what we've seen is that then the power dynamics have shifted so that the people who feel abandoned by the system are attracted to that way of thinking because its opposition is so direct to the establishment way of thinking. So I'm just I'm I'm curious if if that's something that you you grapple with or something that you think about in. Like, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And like I say, it depends on the on the individual and the and the groups really. The, there are some groups who are, I mean, just frankly, are, are of lesser intelligence, and that's not and that's not me pretending to be something ultra smart. There are idiots out there; they exist. I'm not going to pretend they're not just because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. That's not how human society has ever gone. That's not the way. It's, I don't see that that's going to be the way it's ever going to go. Hmm. Um, but yeah, you'll see in my work, not just in the Descent of Manosphere, but in other series and in other videos I've produced, that there are individuals who need to be taken seriously. Not uh, not because they're not because their ideas worthy make of sense, like, but, uh... um, not because their ideas are good or because they're persuasive to me, but they're persuasive to other people and they're dangerous. Those people do need to be taken on. And I don't for a second think that... Um, People like, I mean, Richard Spencer is probably the most famous or the most well-known of them, but there are various people on the alt-right who I don't think are of lesser intelligence. In fact, I'm precisely worried about them because I know they're not of lesser intelligence. I know they can be persuasive. They can um, 
produce ideas that will attract people, some of whom are stupid, but some of whom aren't as well, who are disaffected, who, like you say, want to be seen as outsiders, even though realistically what they're pushing in terms of um, immigration is only really slightly more extreme and out there than the crap that we get from mainstream conservative groups in Europe anyway. Uh, And certainly in America, for instance, I mean, the alt-right are mostly happy with the immigration system in America, um, as Trump is is sort of touting it anyway. Um, But yeah, I I take them seriously because they are um, intelligent, uh, well-organized, in some cases well-funded, and therefore they are actually genuinely a threat. The most baffling thing to me in how the media handles these outlier extreme, like you mentioned Richard Spencer, people like Richard Spencer, how they handle him and and the people that are in his grouping is that they don't really they don't ask him tough questions ever really they just they let him say all these extreme things and don't really challenge them they just they just act surprised that someone could believe such things and i'm guessing just like that disconnection like if you if yeah. you compare that to how socialists are treated they ask like extremely practical uh very um like Uh, bureaucratic questions about how you're going to implement the policies that you're advocating. But no one ever really asks Richard Spencer, how are you going to make these people voluntarily uh, deport themselves from America? Because they probably don't want to. Like if you've, if you've learned anything from the Middle East, it's that people will fight very hard to stay on the ground that they, uh, they come from and that they know and, and and want to preserve. So like, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the obvious example is is the Holocaust. There were Jewish people and, and uh, gypsies and homosexuals and all sorts who stayed where they were. Yeah, they knew uh, they could see that the tide was turning and that you know they would be their lives were being made incredibly, basically impossible. But they didn't leave because people don't leave. People are from where they're from and will always stay there. And yes, that's an absolutely, um, well, frankly, it's a, it's the perfect point, isn't it? Yeah, and the media don't react that way because the media. The, the current media class grew up in the era of the Cold War, where the threat, quote unquote, was um, socialism, right? Um, and so they've only got uh, the kind of socialist or anti-socialist rhetoric to work with because that's all they know. They're lazy. They're they've um, abrogated their duty to democratic or moderate discourse because they've gone so far to curtailing and undermining leftism that they've never really even bothered with how do we take on the far right because they've for most of their upbringing and most of their education a lot of the kind of especially the media establishment not necessarily younger journalists coming through now or independent media but the kind of media establishment haven't had to take on the far right because the far right had their sporadic uprisings and things or sporadic moments but they've never been a systemic threat uh, during that period because in the post-war period everyone was like yeah should we not do nazism whereas unfortunately now we're far enough away from the second world war that a lot of younger people don't necessarily see that immediate horrificness and so you've got a lot of younger people like richard spencer who the nazis have always wanted to make their uh, kind of come back to the main stage and now they're seeing an opportunity to and like I say the media have completely abrogated their duty like you say when a socialist or even even just a social democrat like Bernie Sanders or right. uh, AOC come in the media pressure is enormous in a way that they Richard Spence can go on and go well peaceful ethnic cleansing's fine and they're just like well that's silly yeah. and move on <laughs> well that's it that's all you're going to get from them that's Silly or that's disgusting. They're not actually going to go into, well, fundamentally your system is totally unworkable and you're talking shit. Yeah, because they just assume that people grew up in the same system they grew up in where people knew that it was a terrible idea and that it, it's bound to fail as it's presented yeah. by the Nazis and fascists. Well, exactly, yeah. It's, it's the absolute boomerist mindset of um, everything being set in its place and that this, oh, we can do neoliberal capitalism. That's not going to embolden fascism at all. Yeah. Yes, it is. You're impoverishing huge numbers of people. You make it impossible for any semblance of upward mobility in younger people, and they're going to turn to extreme alternatives. Yeah. You you force this upon the world by being selfish, self-centered, boomer pricks. Um. Yeah. So. So. I have a. 
I have something that I'm thinking about a lot lately, which, or have been thinking a lot, which is uh, kind of like a chicken or the egg situation for me, which is, so, so these people in the Manosphere, especially the audience I'm thinking of, do you think that their descent into the Manosphere mostly has to do with sexism or racism? So is it mostly a response to not getting laid or a response to feeling a, a kind of ethnic, threatened, oh, wow. vulnerable okay. situation? That, yeah. Well, I think that's the progress we've seen uh, from what was the, the the manosphere to what it what those groups are now is actually that transition from uh, sexism to racism. Yeah, the, the the bigotry is mixed in with other types of bigotry. So if you're a sexist, you're probably going to be a bit racist in some sense. You're probably going to be maybe a little bit homophobic. Um, uh, you might be transphobic. There are all kinds of different bigotries, and it's difficult. It seems for people to compartmentalize and differentiate those things and and not engage in those other bigotries that once you open yourself up to being a bigoted piece of shit then it's sort of all on the table yeah and so i think a lot of them are drawn there by sexism by sexual dysfunction by um being unsuccessful with women and they then gravitate into these internet spaces like discord and 4chan and 8chan and the daily stormer and Mm. various other places where um they get told, well, it's not just the women. It's oh, it's the cultural Marxists with their feminism, and it's oh, the Jews with their secret control of things. They're the ones keeping you down. It's not just the women. It's that the white women have been stolen away from you because they've been told to love black dick. Like it's all of that. Mm. It's it's they it's it starts to really intermingle. So it goes from being just these, frankly, rather pathetic people. It seems who are. Um, Awkward, socially awkward, don't make friends easily, don't date very well, aren't incredibly <laughs> attractive to women, don't get on well with women. That becomes a horrific misogyny and it takes them down that path into those other bigotries and those uh, becoming fully fledged, all round extremists. I mean, I think it's quite easy to see how um, an incel, for instance, with the mindset of you know, oh, I'm such a nice guy, but all of these Stacys uh, always end up falling for chads. Uh, it, I, th- I think it might be easy for them to jump from that to the chads are black people or Muslims or whatever. Or Jewish, be. yeah. Or Jewish, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's looking for a scapegoat. It's, it's okay to be, like, um, sexually unsuccessful, let's say. Uh, but it's whether you internalize or externalize that that becomes the problem. If you internalize it, you can end up becoming incredibly depressed and all the rest of it. And if you externalize it, you're always constantly looking for, well, it's not me, I'm brilliant. I'm the supreme <laughs> yeah. gentleman, to use the Elliot Rogers phrase. And, <laughs> and so you're looking for an excuse. Well, why are these women the way they are? They clearly, clearly I'm perfect and therefore they're wrong not to want to fuck me. And so you look for those excuses and they're offered to you in the form of the Jews, uh, the cultural Marxists, uh, immigration, uh, the government, George Soros runs and all of this. That's, that's, and it's very easy to then go, yeah, it's that. It's not that I'm fundamentally unappealing and unattractive and I need to work on bettering myself. No, it's it's the other, the yeah. whatever X group you happen to have blamed. But I think it's important to acknowledge that the kernel of, of what they're going through is actually something that is valid and something that they should be upset about, which is this alienation from others and this loneliness, existential loneliness that comes with living in a neoliberal society. It's like where you're oh, not... Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. I've... I've um, I feel a lot of sympathy for anyone who feels um, completely removed in that sense, in that way, um, especially when they're told that success only comes from being rich, but yet you're literally have no chance of upward mobility to become that rich person. Right. So you're told that this is success and then you're denied any possible way of gaining that success because the system is literally set up to keep rich people rich and poor people poor. But the thing is, um, I, what I can't, look past is the fact that well these people have um these people do like you say they have a valid concern their societies are set up to try and keep them down so to speak but when you externalize that to oh well it's the blacks or the jews or whatever whatever group Hmm. that is a failing on your part that is not just that 
I mean, the media obviously is set up to try and hide the the crimes of the neoliberals and the imperialists and all the rest of it. But ultimately, there's enough information out there to show you actually it isn't the immigrants keeping you down. It's the very, very wealthy. It's the incredibly powerful and well-connected individuals in society, most of whom aren't Jewish or black or immigrants. Right. And I think I think you're right. But I also think it speaks to a general, at least since the Berlin Wall fell and uh, Fukuyama wrote about the end of history, there's been a lack of class consciousness in the Western world in general, I think. So you don't mm. really speak about uh, rich people. Uh, before Bernie Sanders came anyway, no one was really speaking about this vast difference between the people who have everything and the people that have next to nothing and just how incredibly impossible and uh and, and impractical it is to to elevate yourself into a status that is even remotely close to those people that are born extremely rich so i think this this lack of when, yeah. when you don't have class consciousness i think you you go to conspiracy as a refuge to help make sense of the world to help make sense of why some people have so much when you have so little yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I think it was summed up in the poem, uh, We Are All Bourgeois Now, which is literally look at kind of piss take on the idea that we are, right? That we're, t we're sold this lie that um, class isn't the issue or that um, or the class isn't a issue at least. Um, and I remember, oh God, there was a, the, the, the former uh, British Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott, who's a very working class lad who frankly sold the working class out, but that's another issue. Mm. He did a documentary series where he went to people who, Frankly, on the social order, we're below where working class people are, really. I mean, those, these people are the kind of the uh, oft muted underclass, so to speak. Um, and they were being discussed, and they described that when he was talking to them about their social condition, he, they were basically saying that they were middle class. And I can't imagine a less middle class group of people, but they've been sold the lie, right? Mm -hmm. In the West, that we're all essentially these kind of middle class. Uh, yeah. people in order to try and keep people in check right that you, you shouldn't fight for more because you've already got what you want you know mm -hmm. you're already part of this um, middle class or whatever um and i think yeah i think the in a bizarre way even though i mean i'm not a marxist leninist at all the collapse of the eastern bloc was enormously bad just for the self-interest of uh westerners because you the what were the previously really rather decent living conditions of social democratic Europe have been stripped away because there's no threat anymore. So there's no point in them having the concessions that were given to the working class after the Second World War in order to placate them and not, you know, uh, have more countries fall to uh, socialism. Uh, well, that threat isn't there anymore because socialism isn't like, or, you know, Soviet communism isn't, there as a threat, as a bulwark against capitalist hegemony. And so mm. they don't need to even have strong so social systems. You don't, they don't have to have strong unemployment benefits or universal health care or, you know, just generally decent workers' rights because, well, what's your alternative? Yeah. And there isn't one. Uh, something I was wondering about, um, you just mentioned this, that with... Uh, sort of that a clan of sort of uh, left-wing ideas in a way something i've noticed about you know your series is that i think every one of the people you've covered maybe there's one exception but they all seem to be either from center to far right and mostly reading further to the right uh, than center uh, how come yeah that political uh how uh, spread i suppose how come most of these people are like on the right? Um, well, I mean, in terms of them being in the series, there's a selection bias. Obviously, I'm choosing people who are right wing because um, I'm sure there are left wing people who would classify in the series in the sense that they're, you know. Yeah, that's my next question. There are, are left wing people left -wing who are racist. Ones? There are left wing people who are uh, horrific misogynists in some cases. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I'm. I'm just, Focusing solely on the right wing uh, individuals, but yeah, there's there's a propensity for right wing people to be bigoted in that way. So even if I was to do it proportionally, there would still be more right wing people in the series. Yeah, but that's what I was wondering about. Is like, I, I know these people on the left exist, but I don't. Maybe that's just me not looking around enough. But I don't think any of them have as big a platform as you know, these right wing uh, people have, which you've no, uh, covered. Not really. It's mostly on like the Twitter left. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there are some left-wing people who who would fall under the purview of that series, um, 
But they're not as, um, frankly, they're not as um, relevant. They're not yeah. as dangerous. They're not as well suited to the series. Like, I, <laughs> it sounds bad, but I need them to be, uh, or I do not need them to be, but I, I'm specifically targeting people who are, who constantly say horrific, awful shit. Yeah. And even the left wing bigots. And there are, they do exist. Um, it's, I don't know how they justify it in their own minds, but they do exist. Um, they're not anywhere near as bad. Like they don't say, I need them to say horrific things for those little clips packages of them uh, saying yeah. horrific things. Whereas these leftists often just say marginally disgusting things. And that's sort of interesting, but it doesn't make for as it's not um, on the same level. compelling a, um, uh, a, a show. It's like the difference between covering someone who sells snake oil while flexing and someone who's sitting on the side of the road going, maybe women are bad. Yeah, yeah. It, well, yeah, it's it's sort of, yeah, it's the difference between someone who's saying, yeah, genocide, we need genocide now, which is like at least an interesting thing to cover, mm. and someone saying, I, I marginally disagree with rates of immigration. Exactly. Like, yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's... <sighs> That might be coming from the same sort of bigoted place, or the same dislike of the other in you know in a psychological sense, but it's it's not as compelling to watch. Yeah, I think the closest you might get to a left wing uh, manosphere would be the Strasserist, quote unquote, left, or the Nasbol left. Well, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, there are unfortunately there are some people who are on on the kind of Marxist Leninist or frankly Stalinist edge of things who are bigoted as well. They do they are, they do buy into the maybe the Jews are running everything type thing yeah. and well do we really need to focus on women's rights mm, you know that sort of which would fit within the series but class I mean, reductionists gives, essentially. Mm. Yeah, and you just think yeah. well who who gives a fuck? Like I mean there's 12 of them and no one cares. So I'm just not going to bother. It doesn't seem worth my time to cover them. Yeah, mm. no, probably not. Except may, uh, maybe Jason Unruh. He's garbage. Hi, <laughs> uh, Jason. Uh, good old Jason. No, he really is garbage. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Look up his old tweets, like, though. There's a lot of gold there. Yeah. And I know people, I'm friends with people who are friends with him, if that makes sense. Uh, and I like that I'm okay with those people, but Jason himself said some awful shit. Mm. Just fuck it. <laughs> like this, oh, well, this anti-white politics is anti-class struggle. What? Who's, who's anti-white, you piece of shit? Well, that's some garbage <laughs> fucking... These fucking white nationalists come out with. There's no one who's anti-white. Apart, well, there are some black nationalists or whatever, but again, who cares? There's 12 of them. Yeah, no one relevant as such. Yeah. Mm. Fucking idiot. Anyway, <laughs> and, I, I, know, I wouldn't mind, but like he's supposedly a third worldist, so yeah. isn't he anti-white? Ooh, you see, everyone can do it, Jace. <laughs> I saw his god awful debate with Richard Spencer, where um, ah, oh, that was a yeah, well, yeah, that's because that's just a piece something. of shit talking to another piece of shit. So, yeah, I mean, but also cares, just an incredibly competent piece of shit and an incompetent piece of shit. It it got so bad that Richard Spencer asked Jason Unruh if he wanted to plug his channel while the video was uploaded on Jason Unruh's channel. He thought he was the interviewer at the end. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, like I say, just, it's, it's okay, it's, well, it's cat shit and horse shit. <laughs> like one slightly, one slightly less bad, but would you want either of them between two salt slices of bread as a sandwich? No. Imagine if those were only two choices. <laughs> well, in that debate, there was, yeah. I yeah, mean, exactly. I personally like, you know, uh, some ham and, you know, <laughs> slice of tomato, a bit of, you know, a bit of veg, whatever. Whereas some people do seem to enjoy shit sandwiches, which is slightly worrying. A fascinating world we live in. If it offers a community, I guess a lot of people prefer shit sandwiches to just sitting alone playing video games. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, that, it does come from a place, look, as, as we've discussed, of alienation. And I, you know, there are people on the outside of things where who, if you just put an arm around them and say, well, you can be part of our club, that's enough. The fact that that club involves, you know, genociding their next door neighbor who happens to be from a different place. 
seems to be irrelevant to them. They, they found a place where they can belong. And it is interesting, I think, when you talk of online forums, but also in real life, that the alt-right is very welcoming to everyone that wants to talk to them. They will take in everyone and they will not discriminate and they will just uh, associate with everyone they want to and explain their ideas very openly because, uh, let's be honest, they're very simplistic and very easy to understand. But I think on the other hand, you have leftists, a lot of leftists, feel the opposite. Don't feel like it's their job to educate people and don't feel like they have to include people in their community in the same way. So I think as as someone who might have not grown up in politics and maybe not been interested, I can see why people would be more attracted to people uh, who, who on the front appear more like open and more accepting yeah, than the leftists. Yeah, I think there are some more middle class, more comfortable, more uh, frankly, rather pathetic individuals who do engage in that kind of... Um, they want to feel like they're oppressed in ways they're not. Yeah. Not to say they're not oppressed in any ways, but that, they're, that they can just say, oh, well, fuck it, it's not my job to educate you. Well, yeah, it's not your job to do anything, but if you want to have an impact on the world, then telling people, oh, you're an evil piece of shit isn't going to do that, Right. They, if they're being an evil piece of shit, that's fine to point out. But if they're just asking you about a thing, like you've said this, you know, you've made a political statement or a political argument, and they've asked you about that in a perfectly reasonable way, if you then turn around and go, well, what, you just need to educate yourself. Mm. Well, you're being an arrogant dick. Well, that's not... Uh, not only are you not helping, but you're actively hurting the left. Yeah, I agree entirely. Don't do yeah. that. So, a uh, bit of an... Um unrelated question i suppose but uh i'm interested in the men going their own way movement i guess you can call it it seems to have died down a bit I, it doesn't seem to be as active as it once was but I, to my understanding it's an offshoot of the incel involuntary celibate community yeah it's it's well incel is a more broad term which encompasses a great many people from different groups like mras um not puas that would be silly but um <laughs> uh, imagine being an incel pui you'd have to be the least huh? successful pui ever anyway um yeah the, uh, the, so it encompasses much more but incel as a term is essentially newer than migtail migtail around before that essentially men going their own way um, I mean, oh, firstly, I wish they would just go the fuck away. <laughs> like, that's the thing. They don't actually seem to move anywhere. They seem to talk about women more than feminists do. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Walk um, off the side of a cliff, essentially. That, well, <laughs> metaphorically, of course. We yeah. couldn't possibly of course. justify of course. Any, any such things. But I mean, if they wanted to walk into a wood threshing machine, I wouldn't cry. <laughs> um, no, they're garbage. I mean, they are awful human beings who basically think that women are, are actively seeking to hurt all men in every conceivable way because, you know, oh, their ex-wife wasn't very nice. Yeah. Or they had, like, a bad experience once where a woman cheated on them and therefore all women are evil sluts. Like, that's literally what they think, these fucking idiots. Yeah. Um, and so they've decided to not... But essentially, they're not incels, they're... Vocels? Vol they're voluntary yeah. celibates, most of them. Although some of them still engage... For uh, they they call it uh, uh, primalistic reasons, with mm. <laughs> like they essentially use women as vessels in which to unload their seed and then leave. Um, uh, although they, of course, they would have to wear condoms because they know that all women are trying to get secretly pregnant so that they can get child support from you. Because as we all know, living on child support is a fantastic life. Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure the I'm sure the child support will uh, cover all expenses here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and clear on my favourite conspiracy theory ever, that of sperm jacking. Don't know if you know what that is. No. Well, uh, please <laughs> inform us. Where a man will actively seek out ways, mostly sort of uh, condoms, I suppose, to not get women pregnant, but then women steal their sperm. Uh, they will yeah. actually pull the <laughs> condom out of the bin. And artificially <laughs> inseminate themselves in order to get the man on the hook for child support. Mm. Yeah, it couldn't just be that the condom split or something and you didn't notice. And then you can no longer be a vol cell who engages in primalistic urges or single. Mm. Oh, the struggle is real. The struggle is yeah. real. <laughs> so they basically, they, yeah, they basically become voluntary celibates and sit on the internet calling women awful names. Oh. 
Okay. Mm. It is like a cult, isn't it? Oh god, yeah. 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 And they've got their yeah. own t- the I I've in some of the videos of the series I've outlined yeah, you some, covered of their some of these uh, vocabulary, events, haven't you? right where they've got their own terms yeah. which to the uninitiated it sounds like they're talking utter gibberish <laughs> like it's just none of it makes any sense yeah but once you get it you realize oh actually they're being atrocious human beings oh okay mm. oh cool yeah yeah you've covered some of these events as well before eh? you mentioned a moment ago about you know how a lot of these people have like one bad experience with like their uh, ex-wife or girlfriend and suddenly all women are evil and you've covered some of these events where literally all the speeds are just that you know my ex-wife ran out on me or this or you know, she cheated on me or my mum did this and it's kind of ridiculous really <laughs> oh yeah I mean they are they they despise women and essentially oh, yeah. they're again they're externalising their own um, issues they've got their own Issues with self-confidence and um, uh, loneliness, alienation, depression, possibly other mental illnesses. And they're externalizing that. They're saying, oh, it's women that did this. Uh, Which, I mean, look, in some cases, there may be an element to which maybe their ex-wife was unpleasant and did cause problems and was the issue. But it certainly isn't the case in all. Like, you just think just the the nature of things, it would be at the very least 50-50, right? <laughs> in most cases. like and yeah. Yeah, But yeah, it's, oh, it's the entire, the women's fault. A woman did this, therefore all women are terrible, which yeah. is ridiculous. And then it yeah. becomes, it is, it's genuinely pathological with them to the point where, I mean, some of them enact an awful violence based upon it. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, something else I was uh, wondering about. Um, when I uh, first started, you know, looking around on YouTube, you know, years and years and years ago, uh, I sort of briefly dabbled in this nonsense. I sort of got into this uh, through like uh, watching like atheist channels, like uh, Thunderfoot and Amazing Atheist, and they would have like some anti-feminist stuff on there. From there, you know, go into like some other things like uh, girl rights, what, and from there. You'd get exposed to like more extreme stuff like it seemed to be a bit of a pipeline going on there at the time um is that something you've also seen in your like series that it seems to be sort of like a track you go through these and end up you know at the far end uh, of the whole thing hello hello, hello? Oh, so you cut out then you said oh, sorry you got to girl um, rights what and something yeah you get to girl rights yeah. what and then uh you might get to the even more extreme stuff from there, like, uh, uh, what's his face, uh, Paul Elam, oh, the yeah. uh, voice for men, who's, uh, I guess they're both about equally bad, but one of them presents themselves a, a bit less bad, at least. Uh, you know, from there, I mean, I, I don't know what's more extreme than Paul Elam, to be honest, but it's sort of that seems to be a bit of the, uh, you know, the pipeline uh, direction. Yeah. But, yeah, is that something you've also seen in... How does that world look like now? Like, how do you get into this world nowadays? Um, the, the forums are more extreme, it seems to me now. But the the the, the pipeline is still there. It's just that it's sort of diversified, as I say. The, the I mean, a voice for men is still there, um, and they hold uh, this, the international conference on men's issues. And I've covered the last, I think, three years where that's happened. Um, um, in the series, right? Uh, so they're doing sort of real world stuff as well, which is uh, a little bit worrying, albeit that it's not that big a deal at the moment. Um, but yeah, the pipeline exists where you can go to places like that or, uh, well, Return of Kings is, is sort of mothballed at the moment, but you've got things like Chateau Artiste and, um, and 4chan and places like that where um, those disaffected, angry young men can be sent down the pipeline, but they're going even further than people like Paul Elam, who is garbage, absolutely, but they're being sort of funneled towards more um, alt-right places, Hmm. more far-right sort of neo-Nazi places than even uh, A Voice for Men, which is not is pretty unpleasantly right-wing, but isn't, like, genocidal, necessarily. Hmm. Right. I suppose those genocidal people went around when I uh, went down this pipeline. Well, they probably were, but they just they were less, uh, less big, less, I suppose. Yeah, less numerous, less um, open, less influential. Yeah. 
just a follow up to that. Sorry, a bit is um, how do you see the state of left tube or whatever you want to call it, like bread tube? I hate that term, but do you see it as like uh, <laughs> an increasingly good community, or do you see it as like what? What's your general impression oh, of its it state? Oh, it's much better now than it was. A hell of a lot better. Mm. Um, like I say, I started my channel because basically there wasn't a left tube. Oh yeah, yeah. The 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 bakery was empty, so to speak. Um, <laughs> uh, for the see bread tubes, who wanted that? Oh, <laughs> very clever. Um, yeah, uh, th yeah. There weren't enough people making leftist content, whereas now there are a lot more people making leftist content, and there's a genuine sense of community to some extent. Although I understand that people don't necessarily like the idea of it being a community because there are various different types of political groupings and and people who get on and don't get on and there's drama and stuff obviously but but there's um, a right. there's a, a community that um that exists now and you've got bigger channels that's the thing you need channels of various different sizes um, um and you've got those bigger channels now like contrapoints h bomber guy uh, peter coffin um three arrows who have got you know six figures and and rising and are, are genuinely sort of influential and you've got smaller channels uh, in the sort of tens of thousands and then you've got little guys like me as well who chip in and uh, that's actually really important so i think the left tube is growing and is already yeah, in a much better place than it was that's way better now uh when i was was going down a pipeline i was like seven years ago like the only guy i think on youtube was doing left-wing content so this i was aware of was jason fucking unruh which like you've mentioned earlier, not the best. No. So no. Um, well, he was yeah, clearly he was an early adopter of like the platform as a thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's awful. <laughs> yeah, but I was also like one of the only people around doing something left uh, content on YouTube. I don't think there were many others. At least not anywhere near as big as he was at that time. Hmm. Well, he was big, but you know. Relatively. Yeah, the left. It the left really did get like a really slow start to oh, yeah. the internet age. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, something you just mentioned uh, a moment ago was uh, the Voice for Men conference thing they organised. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering how much of this men's rights stuff uh, on YouTube actually translates into anything happening in the real world. It doesn't. <laughs> no, no, don't just say that to be like funny, but it genuinely yeah, nah. doesn't. They're so vile. I and mean, I've said this before. They. As with uh, the, uh, previous groups, there are genuinely legitimate issues they raise. The in massively increased suicide rates, uh, homelessness is a predominantly male thing. There are loads of really actually crucial issues that could and should be treated um, and dealt with by poli uh, politicians and uh, by society at large. But these people make it impossible t for mainstream politicians to actually tackle this issue. They're not. A they're not just... Um, not helping the issues they claim to care about, uh, although I, I suspect many of them don't actually really care. They just they just want to rant, but they they not only don't help; they actively are a roadblock to change in those areas. Because mainstream politicians might want to take on these issues because they clearly are issues, but then they look at the advocates for those issues, and it's you know um, weird. Yeah, rape. you wouldn't want not to be rape associated. <laughs> like rape. I, I mean, I literally describe them as rape enthusiasts. They seem to actively like enjoy the fact that rape happens, and so what politician's going to touch that? You know. Well, um, to bring it to your country, uh, UKIP and uh, Carl uh, Benjamin, which has worked oh, right. out so well. Something happened there then, because I, I haven't I haven't been following the story really. I don't I don't know what's happening. <laughs> what's, what's going on there? Oh no, UKIP seems to have taken a bit of a hit recently. That's, that's all. Yes. Oh, I ever I've... since starting to associate with her. Uh, Benjamin. Yes, it's it's been a lot of fun. Um, oh yeah. Yes, Carl, <laughs> Carl Benjamin, aka Sargon of a Cad, and and indeed Count Dankula, um and uh, various other pricks have decided to stand for UKIP for the European elections, which weren't really meant to be happening here in Britain because of the whole Brexit thing. But they are happening, so you know. So this it should be reasonably fertile ground for UKIP. Uh, but but they because of Carl Benjamin and his past, um, the press the press coverage of them has been universally negative, and they've yeah, just absolutely to fallen watch. through the floor in terms of the polling numbers. They're currently on course to literally win no seats. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Is is amazing. But the problem is, 
I'd, actually, it seems like they've done too good a job at destroying the party because what would have been interesting is if uh, Nigel, because Nigel Farage, the former UKIP leader, has now set up the Brexit party, which looks like it might actually win the popular vote here in Britain. And so it would have been good for UKIP to split the Brexit vote, but they're literally going to win so few votes now that they're not even going to split that vote particularly. Uh, they're a minor party now. They're nothing. They're like, you know, when they have like the graphics that come up on the news and it'll say like the main party and the second party, third party, and then other, mm -hmm. which is like all the other little parties. UKIP are now other. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's a shame that they, that Saigon hasn't managed to split the vote there. Yeah. Well, he's, that's the thing. He's so toxic that even, yeah. even the Brexit press, which used to really like UKIP are like, well, we can't support you now. <laughs> this is yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, this is even too far for us. Come yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. Like the the weird stuff about it depends on the child. Like, no oh, one's yeah, no, who's in favour of pedophilia. Ridiculous. It's always fun to see where the media's line is. Where, yeah. where they where they won't support you and you can you can say what you want about immigrants. You can say what you want about uh, them all being criminals, but don't you dare say something about children. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, and it's we amazing. saw that with Milo. Uh, with Milo Yiannopoulos, and it's interesting that Milo's now going to come over and will be campaigning with uh, Carl, with uh, Carl Benjamin. <laughs> and I just think, I mean, it's an unusual strategy, but they've got the kind of pro pedophilia um, yeah. uh, vote. A winning ticket. They've got they've got the pro pedophilia uh, demographic absolutely sorted. They've got yeah. that stitched up. I mean, that oh, must be a so? huge boost to the votes. Yeah, you reckon that's yeah. a big part of the uh, what was it, southwest London, uh, southwest England? Uh, I don't think it's a huge <laughs> amount of any constituency ever, because like, literally, mm. it's even. I don't mean uh, I, uh, I can't remember who said it now, but it's the crime that even criminals despise. Like if you're yeah. a pedophile and you go to prison, <laughs> other prisoners will kill you. Mm. Hasn't he turned into a musician now, Milo Yiannopoulos? Is he a musician? I think he's turned to music. That's the new turning to God. Oh, he's turning well, to music. God. it's either going to be that or porn for him. I mean, let's be real. <laughs> oh, I'd love Maybe. to see Milo try his hand at rapping. That would be hilarious. I think that that's what he does. That would be interesting. I think that's what he oh, does. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to do that up later. Yeah, I have, I have a question, another question, keeping it kind of related to Britain. Um, we've seen for the longest, longest time in, in, in Britain and in, in the rest of Europe and in in. in pretty much every parliamentary system. We've seen this coalition that is sometimes called the broad left, where you have everyone that's sort of willing to work within a semi-leftist framework come together to form governments. Uh, a great example of this is the Blairite uh, third way uh, way of, of combining Thatcherite economics, but also with uh, a more socially progressive point of view. Um, that, that kind of seems to be falling apart a bit now, where people more look for the fringes or look more to uh, extremer parties, as is seen in, in, in Italy and also in the UK. What do you see this coalition going in the future? Do you think it should we should stop trying to force these p people together? Or do you think it's, it's viable for the more fringe elements on the left and the right to, to lead in any meaningful way? Um, I think the... Firstly, the reason that it's they are those kind of um, weak social democratic forces um, are dying is because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that neoliberalism doesn't work, um, and so the the right have turned towards more nationalistic pro capitalism, and the left more and more are turning to a kind of, at the very least, uh, capitalist critical, not necessarily anti capitalist, but capitalist critical um, mode. With people mm. like Bernie Sanders and AOC, and, um, here in Britain with Jeremy Corbyn and so on, um, and I think that's the way it will go because the younger generations now coming through realise that oh, actually this neoliberal economic boomer shit isn't actually viable in the long run. But it doesn't so seem I like think they that's have the way it'll a... go, and it will become that what was the extreme <clears throat> it actually won't be extreme anymore. The centre ground is basically ceasing to exist, and um, the kind of what was the more traditional element of it, of, of conservatives being kind of one nation centre right and uh, the social democratic parties actually being social democratic mm. will return to what it was. Maybe. it has to because this, this um, low tax, high spending on uh, fucking nuclear weapons and shit, that isn't sustainable. 
mm. and everyone knows it. You can't have eternal growth. It's ridiculous. But there doesn't seem to be any uh, program. There doesn't seem to be any uh, any guidelines for the left uh, or the right, really, as far as I see it. Everyone just seems to be reacting to one another. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's always if, if yeah, Hillary Clinton the- says something, the right wing will... will do a, uh, a a think piece about how she's terrible for thinking this or and if uh, a neoliberal government is thinking of cutting education there'll be some protests by students it doesn't seem like nobody's really nobody has any program or anything leading us forward which is also why i think these centrist uh, types tend to to dominate the entire thing because they know that their program is status quo essentially and yeah. since no one else is stepping up and offering anything else, then do you see do you see any program kind of emerging, or what do you imagine that would look no, like? No, well, I don't. I, there isn't one at the moment, but there needs to be one, and I think that's that's true. But we have to create it. Mm. It's as simple as that. There's no like looking um, to to use a phrase by Abraham Lincoln of all people. We can no longer live by the quiet dogmas of the past. Right. We can't. Okay. We we do. We have to create our own future that looking back towards marx or um, the frankfurt school thinkers or anything like that isn't really viable no there's not to say there's nothing to learn from those people and i'm not saying they were stupid or anything but they were writing about a very different world mm. we have to create our own new leftism so to speak jazz to isn't actually, the biggest threat to western civilization the world anymore. and the way that the where the world will be in 50 years or 100 years which is very difficult that's why marx was the genius that he was he saw the development of industry um but that's what we need we need people like that to those kind of um, and that's where I, what i was talking about earlier we need those academic philosophical types to do that kind of labor that kind of mental labor um uh in order to create what is what will be leftism going forward because yeah there are no guidelines because the smashing of the post-war consensus and the removal of you know, the threat of socialism and, and like you say, the kind of the, the theorized end of history thing means that there are no guidelines because what was isn't anymore. And so we have to create what will be. Hmm. Yeah. How do you know creationist cat? How do I know? Well, I, I don't know creationist cat. I know uh, Vadim Newquist, who is. The, oh, yeah, Vadim. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll have to break, break character for you, Vadim. Sorry. Is the voice of creationist cat. <laughs> um, uh, just through some Hello? talking online and stuff, like we Hello. we we bonded over. Or did I disconnect? Uh, Kraut and T. Are you aware of him? Uh, Somewhat. Yeah, kind of weird, weird German atheist. Well, no, Austrian technically. Uh, atheist um, YouTuber idiot. Anyway, he made a hit piece against various leftists, uh, including me and Vadim Newquist, um, creationist cat. And so we, uh, as a response to that, we kind of were talking and stuff, and we got to know each other. And yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, he seems like I love the videos. By the way, uh, endorsement here followed to uh, creationist Ken. Yeah, I was just curious because I saw you you did a live stream with him, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting mix. Yeah, I've done a couple actually. Yeah, um, and um, I've, I've he said, look, I mean, I might get him to do some voiceover stuff in the future. I don't know. That would be cool. Yeah. Just a general question is, how should we as leftists talk? Like, how do you talk to an individual that is like deep in the manosphere? Um, you don't. You just get out the fucking guillotine and, and do your business. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, jo- I'm joking, of course. Um, how do you talk to them? <sighs> You have to be honest first and foremost. There's no point pretending that what they are is brilliant, and that can be difficult. And there'll be some that you can't get through to. There are some that are so far in the hole that any change that happens for them has to happen via their own uh, life experiences, and they have to reach um, some sort of conclusion themselves. But there are a lot that can be reached, and the way in which you reach them. Again, d- depends because this is the thing. It, there's no one size fits all for every person, right? It's going to be different based on their own experiences and the kind of person they are. But the ones that we can reach, the more um, centrist types or the or, well, the leftist types, whatever, who might have fallen into that rabbit hole, you need to you need to just basically inform them that look, this is a it's not healthy for you, and b um, the 
the solutions you're seeking aren't solutions. They're not actually going to, nothing good can come of this. That ultimately, the, the people you're blaming for the problems that you've perceived and the problems that you have in your life aren't actually the ones who are going to be able, aren't really the, the, the roadblock to your happiness. And that actually, if you just work on making yourself a better person, you'll be happier and you'll find that interactions with other people will be easier. Now, there'll be, that might, that's a, that's a more general answer because, like I say, it'll depend on person to person how exactly you get that idea across. But that's what you have to get across to them that ultimately, even, I mean, it's destructive for society to have those people be the way they are, but it's also destructive for the individuals themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also important to emphasize that. The, the, there's a lot of differences in these audiences. I think like the the person who is like attracted to what Rush V has to say, I don't think is the same person who would listen much to what uh, say Thunderfoot had to say back in the day, or maybe what uh, uh, what to say Sargon of Akkad has been saying over yeah. the last like few years. It's I, I wouldn't know how he reached the Rush V fan. I, 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 I have some idea how to reach the other ones though. Like, yeah, I don't think you can re- reach a Rouge V fan. If, um, he, if he literally, I mean, Rouge V's gone crazy. He was always was awful, but now he's mental. He, he, was, he put out a thing the other, a few weeks ago about looking at women's asses means you're gay. What? Because you're looking at an ass, and therefore it's like an anal thing, and therefore you're gay. I think he drank the Kool Aid. I think he started out as a, a I think cynical. He drank battery acid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but essentially, I think he started out as a cynical snake oil salesman type yeah. who who wanted to make some quick money writing about how to get with women, and then slowly but surely he he became convinced by his own community that all the stuff he was saying was actually true and divine wisdom, and like he just got progressively crazier and crazier. Yeah. Just for the audience who are quickly, uh, for those ones aware of Rouge V, could you give a bit of a description of what he does? Yes, well, uh, this is a man, uh, he, Rouge V is his online moniker, his real name is Darius Valizadeh. He's a half Iranian who was against immigration. Brilliant. Um, his dad was from Iran. Um, he's uh, He came from the pickup artist side of the Manosphere, although he created his own thing called Neo Masculinity. Which is like pickup artistry mixed with fascism, uh, mm. and I'm not saying that to be provocative. It literally is that. It's like a kind of weird pseudo ethno nationalism mixed with pickup artistry, where cis straight men are awesome and everyone else is kind of shit. That's the basic gist of of that philosophy. And he does videos and writes books. He's got a series called Bang. Uh, which is like, so it'll be like, bang Iceland, bang Ukraine, bang mm-hmm. Britain, bang America. That's the kind of gist of it. <laughs> don't it goes bang around those Denmark. Various... Pardon? Uh, don't bang Denmark. Yeah, don't bang Denmark, because <laughs> apparently the women in Denmark didn't sleep with him, so therefore they're awful. You can't manipulate them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, uh, well, he couldn't manipulate the ones in uh, Iceland, so he literally raped a woman. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, that happened. That's literally in his book. Um, yeah, he's he's awful. I don't know why he isn't in prison somewhere. He's a very dangerous That's man. That's a good question. Um, yeah, and he writes those books, and they're, I mean, they are so poor. Not just the ideas expressed in them are bad. They're really, really atrociously written. Like, it's like a seven-year-old racist sexist writing books. It's embarrassing. I can confirm that. I wrote a bit of Banging Russia one day when I was bored and uh, it's atrocious. It's really uh, uh, first year high school student level bad. Yeah, Ooh, I did a uh, long time ago now I did um, a series analysing um, Bang Ukraine which I was going to turn into a bigger thing. It's called the Feminazi Reads um, where I, I the, uh, the titular Feminazi uh, read like Manosphereian books, but I only did that one, and I did Bang Ukraine, and it was it's so yeah it's it's offensive on any number of levels, but also in a literary sense, like mm-hmm. it's just it's so shit. Yeah, he yeah he writes like a child, and thinks like an animal. And he should have come up with a better term than neo masculinity. He could have he could have at least called it neo machismo or something. Yeah, but that sounds a bit foreign. True. No, that's true. True. Wait till someone tells him fascism comes from Italy. 
<laughs> well, yeah, but they, I think they're... Well, this is the thing. He does... <laughs> He's not white, but he does white supremacy stuff, mm-hmm. and I don't know uh, why. That is, that's a brilliant. Yeah, look, he's weird. Look, he, like I say, his dad was from Iran, right? So he's visibly a bit brown, and there, and he, like, he's just not like a Caucasian. He's just not, uh, but yet he's like plays into all this white supremacy shit. So he's cucking and he's, like, himself. A huge fan of Donald Trump, even though under Donald Trump's plan, his dad wouldn't have been allowed into America. He's cucking himself, essentially. He's, so he's, yeah, yeah. He, he, he's, he's advocating for policies that would bring himself into physical harm. Yep. That's yep. wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah, I have no idea how to reach someone who is a fan of that guy. Well, you, yeah, uh... you, like I say, I don't think you can. That Those are the people that are so far gone that they, the only way they can change is either through going so far that they get imprisoned or they realise the error of their ways and change themselves. I don't think they can be reached by, like, moderate means. Oh yeah, my my cult analogy wasn't it. It wasn't a joke. I really do think that a lot of these people that are very deep into the incel community or the men's rights community or the the whatever Rouches is at this point. Yeah, or, or, well, not just like, that, but the people. Look, I don't know if you're aware of them, the True Force loneliness. Yeah, those TFL people. guys. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it, there are various of them. Well, I think you have to like make toe and stuff. Yeah, I think I think you have to just approach them like they are a member of a very dangerous cult, uh, yeah. and you have to talk to them like they're in a cult and uh, be be very aware of of just how conditioned they've been and how everything that they believe has been ingrained in them in a way that's and they've been groomed online or in real life to respond to every one of your criticisms if you if you talk to them in person i don't think you could say anything to them online or in person that would surprise them or catch them off guard really because they've been trained for so long these people to deflect criticism and to uh not uh, be uh, too critical of their own ideology at any point yeah exactly because they're so uh, fundamentally it comes down to insecurity yeah these people are so self-loathing in many respects and so alienated from the world around them which look as we discussed is a perfectly reasonable reaction in some senses but they've externalized it in really hideously cancerous ways yeah you've uh, dealt a lot with uh sargon of card himself and presume also with his audience like no, I've never heard one... of him who's <laughs> uh some random guys running for uh the European Parliament. So a nobody. Yeah, basically. Uh, anyway, um, Sargon of Akkad and, like, and his audience, like, how would you approach those people, like his audience specifically, not uh, the man himself? Well, in the way that I have, basically, in that um, when I go on to talk to, to Carl, as I have from time to time, I, I'm not really talking to him. Like, I am literally talking to him, obviously, but I'm I'm talking past him to his audience and that I try and mock him and refute his arguments. And uh, whether that's the most um, advantageous way to do it, I don't know any other way I could do it. Like it's not within my skill set to be able to do it any other way. And I know it's had some positive impact because I've been, I've been contacted by loads of people who say, Oh yeah, I used to be a fan of his until I heard you talk to him about this and I realised, oh, he's sort of full of shit. And then that's the, that's the thing. You're never going to take someone, and I don't try to like, completely convince someone of an opposite point of view. What I try and do is plant ideas in people's heads, just plant a seed and allow them to work it out themselves. Because I'm not... You, people who have fixed ideas in their heads aren't going to give those up very easily. And if they do, then any idea that's um, accepted uncritically and easily can easily be replaced by something else just as easily right and those so those people are just not mentally you're not going to be able to do a lot with them whereas um most people fall into the category of they have relatively fixed ideas and they they can be changed but you have you have to essentially allow them that process themselves so i go on to his channel or i make a response to him or i get into a twitter spat with him and i'm not again i'm not really talking to him i'm talking to his audience and planting ideas in their heads and giving them an alternative point of view on a topic and allowing them to go where they will with it and some will respond by telling me to go fuck myself some of them will say well i don't i'm not convinced by this but some will actually get to thinking about it 
and I've had I've been contacted by many hundreds now over the years who have said, oh, well, thank you for doing what you do because you made me think about this a different way. And I realised, oh, well, that's not a healthy approach to things and they've become better people for it. And therefore, I think society and uh, culture has become better for it. That's a yeah, really meaningful definitely. thing to do, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Like, like Simon wasn't around when I was going down this rabbit hole, but had he been, then I definitely would have been a fan of his. But that's also the thing which got me out of his, realising that a lot of these people were just full of shit. Yeah. I also don't... Also, what made me realize, well, rather, what made me come out of it was realizing that some of these people just were lying, just outright lying to push their points. And yeah, well, yeah, uh, exactly. What what convinced me that I shouldn't go down that line because I was an angry young man too uh, was uh, realizing that a lot of them are doing it for the grift. They're doing it for the money. They're not interested in actually like changing something for the better. Like, regardless of where I ever was in politics, I was always. I always wanted to make like a difference. I always actually wanted to, the world to be better, regardless of whether I was like a liberal or a socialist or whatever. Uh, I always wanted like a change to happen, something positive to go forward with, um, in order to leave the world a better place than you found it. Right? That's the basic gist of life, really. Um, whereas I found with these people, they don't really give a shit. Some of them probably do believe it. But some probably don't, and none, regardless, it doesn't matter because they're not doing it to try and make a difference. They're doing it to earn a living, which, I mean, under capitalism is what you have to do, of course, but you're also lying to people. You're pretending to be, to really care about a topic that you don't care about, and that's underhanded and just d devious. Did you see yeah, that video? A... Did you see that video that Blair White uploaded when she retired from online politics, quote unquote? Oh yeah, um, she's full of shit. Yeah, but she made an interesting point uh, in in what she said was that one of the reasons that she left was that she found out that so many of the people that she interacted with were disingenuous in their political leanings, which more or less backs up what you're saying. And I think she made a lot yeah. of allegories to, especially Dave Rubin, being disingenuous. Oh as yeah, Dave Rubin's in. all about the money. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, uh, I think probably one of the great examples of that was when. Um, uh, a British journalist, Laurie Penny, went to California to do like a, a a piece interviewing Milo Yiannopoulos when Milo Yiannopoulos was still like a you know reasonably well known and and admired Relevance. within right wing circles person, right? And they were taking a taxi together to go to some. I think they were. I think it was during the election during uh, Donald Trump's election mm. when. Um, that I think they were going to like a gaze for Trump event, which I can't imagine was very well attended. But anyway, <laughs> um, he uh, and Milo Yiannopoulos, like Laurie Penny really didn't like him. Right. And they were sort of talking back and forth. And he, he said to her, oh, why, why are you still interviewing me in, in the car? Like, why can't we just talk normally? And she said, well, you, you know, you want, you've said some absolutely disgusting things, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, yeah, but that's all just part of the game, isn't it? We can still be friends, right? Oh yeah, he said and, that on Bill Maher's show. Like he's yeah. very upfront about like ju this is just one. It's he treats it like theater essentially. Yeah, so he's not being honest. No, he's not doing this to make a, like a positive change in the world. He's doing this because it's the way he makes money. And like, and Laurie Penny literally said to him, "Well, no, we can't be friends." Like mm. you've said these awful things, you believe these awful things. I can't be friends with you at all. And that's, I mean, that's, that's, I think, the difference between someone who's genuine and someone who's just doing it for the money and the fame and all of that. Mm. Yeah, it's something I wanted to ask was, of, of like, all the people you've covered, you've, how many episodes have you done now? Like, 62-ish or something? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, of all the people you've covered, like, how many of those do you think are genuine and how many are just doing it, like, for the money? Oh, wow. Um... I, I think it's like rough estimates. You know? I think most are genuine in the sense that they actually believe what they're saying. There are some who probably don't, who are just literally saying it because that's how you make money, right? But I think mo I think say ninety percent of them genuinely believe it. But even within that ninety percent, there's probably twenty percent that, whilst they do believe the things mostly that they're saying, they're not saying it because they believe it. They're saying it because they want to. That's how they get on. That's part of the their strategy. Yeah. 
Um, maybe we should wrap it up here. Um, yeah, I'm out of questions. Uh, that was, oh, hang on, no, I have one last question, which I would really like to ask. I'm sure you've probably answered it before, but uh, well, I suppose two parts. Like, what was your favorite uh, person's like cover, and who do you think of all the people you've covered is like the most? I don't know, dangerous, despicable, that kind mm. of thing. Okay, but my, my favorite one, I still have to go back to one of the early ones, War Corpse 666, is the uh. stupidest human being in the world. Um, and uh, it, it was so much fun. Like, he's a gold mine of idiocy. He really oh, is. Oh, yeah. He just, you, can, you could literally watch any one of his videos, and I mean this, any one of his videos, and analyze it and get good content out of it. Because he's just, he says the dumbest shit all the time. And he's so confident. He's so confident that what he's saying is like profound and meaningful and worthwhile. And it never is, or almost never is, anyway. Um, and it comes from a place of kind of innocence in a way, because he's so dumb. Like he's not, he's sort of, like if he had brain cells, he would be dangerous, but he doesn't, so he isn't. Mm. Um, so th he's still, I think, probably my favourite because he was so dumb. Although there have been some ANCAPs that have been just as dumb. Anyway, but I I'll go with Walker. In terms of who's most dangerous, um... Oh, wow. Um... I mean, you can probably from, like, you no, know, just individually or to, like, society at large. Yeah, well, in terms of women's safety, probably Rouge V because, again, yeah, he, yeah. He, he is a rapist. Um... In terms, uh, Rouge, uh, um, Vox Day, who I mentioned earlier, who, like I say, I think he would be more than happy to be like a uh, putting people in in gas chambers if if given the chance. And I think there are a few people in the series like that, but I think he's probably the most um, obvious of them. So he's probably the most dangerous, to be honest. Yeah. He's the guy who read the alt right manifesto. He I is think. indeed. Yes, which I covered in that in his episode of the series. Uh, read by the fantastic um, Steve Shives doing his sort of <laughs> redneck hillbilly accent, which was fun. Um, I don't know, I can't even remember why I got him to do it in that voice, but anyway, it was funny. Um, yeah, he did write that. Yeah, he's um, he's like I say, I, 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 as I mentioned earlier, I treat him seriously because he's not stupid. He's dangerous. I, don't know. I mean, he said he believes lots of dumb shit, like he's into all kinds of conspiracy stuff, but he's not like a dumb human. He's not. He's a, a dangerous, calculating fascist. All right. So, um, would you like to uh, plug your channel and everything? No. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. <laughs> I, I, I'm Kevin Logan. You can find me uh, if, by typing Kevin Logan into the YouTube's, and you can check out my um, my low grade leftist nonsense. And we're also going to put a link in the description, of course. And uh, thank you no, thank so you. much for for joining us. This is this has been a real treat. Well, thank you for having me. This has been fun, yeah. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.